Cool. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I was actually born in Leeds, so not too far away, but I've spent way too long kind of down south. So <laughs> I, I currently live in Somerset, but I work for a bank in London at the moment, um, Clear Bank. And um, yeah, I'm a senior software engineer there. I've been there for about four years and um, just started speaking kind of this year, really. So I've done this talk a few times, a few different meetups, um, just testing it out, really, to see whether it's something I like or not. So as was mentioned, you're probably not going to be able to see the code that I'm going to show you later from the back. So if you want to move, feel free, because um, the screen is quite small. But uh, yeah, so yeah, you, you can also have this one. Um, so yeah, I'm going to start with a question. Yeah, go for it. Have that, have that one as well. Yeah, so I'm going to start with a question. Um, I'm looking down because I've got a second screen here with my notes on. So uh, yeah. Have you ever found yourself looking through one of your repos and thinking, how on earth did it get so complex? Or does it really need to be this complex? Or perhaps another one, how on earth am I going to start explain this to a new starter? And that could go both ways as well, because you could have someone who's brand new or a career switcher, and you're thinking, this is an awful lot to explain to someone who's brand new to this industry. Or maybe you've got a senior, and you're a little bit embarrassed of what the state of your repo is in. But time and time again, you come to a repo, and you look at it, and you just think, is it too complex for the actual problem it's solving? Or like, how did it get to this state? And presumably, these repos start out, all repos start out greenfield, nice and clean, clear intent. But sooner or later, this kind of accidental complexity seeps in. And it might be because like, the OG members of the team kind of gradually leave, or maybe there's um, new ideas, maybe there's a change of direction or change of priority, maybe some corners are cut, whatever. But over time, you can get to this, this point where the intent of the code is completely lost. And we're left with something that's hard to understand and quite hard to maintain. So this talk, I'm going to hopefully take you on part of a journey that my team and I have recently been on, actively and intentionally trying to avoid and solve this problem as we go. So just a caveat, I'm not saying that everyone should do exactly what we did, but I'm sharing it because it was a really interesting journey and hopefully it can provoke some thought and um, you'll, you'll find it interesting. So to start off, I have a diagram which should draw itself here. So this is the kind of flow. Um, Apologies, the writing is really small. That says user initiates process. So then we've got like an API phase. There's going to be a box, which I should have drawn first, but it will appear later. So we'll do some validation, perhaps create and persist an aggregate. So that means domain events in some kind of data store. We might fetch some data from an external service, like maybe we'll check an account's domain that the account is active or something like that. Make some decisions based on that data, and then eventually call an external service because this process is longer than the user would care to wait in the synchronous portion of an API call. So at that point, the external service will carry on asynchronously, will send a, an accepted or something back to the user. So this is the API kind of handler. Then we use something like service bus and some integration events. So the external service or services do their job. We can then rehydrate our aggregate by handling that domain event, do some more stuff, perhaps save an outbox record into the database. Uh, so this will be our kind of integration event handler or kind of message, message handler. And now, now we've got outbox records in our database. And then maybe we'll poll for those outbox records, dispatch some events back to service bus. And that will be like the third part of our service. And this is the service kind of context that I'm talking about. Meanwhile, some kind of webhook service may probably listen to that last outbox event and send a message back to the user who's now got a smile on his face. So hopefully this is kind of like typical back office automation style thing that people are familiar with working on. And this, I guess, would be our kind of, oop. Uh, yeah, here we go. So this would be the, um, like a repo, three executable services, the API, the integration event handler, and the outbox kind of processor single database, probably deployed as one, so I guess what you might call a modulith these days. Um, and this is the kind of thing that I'm talking about. And the problem that we were having is this area here. So this is a greenfield project. We were kind of iterating uh, as each story came by. We were adding more of this kind of flow here. And it was getting to around 100 lines. We were thinking, right, we want to do something about that because we don't want all of that in that handler there. 
So uh, we've kind of watched it grow. We didn't just we didn't just do it. We thought we'll get some buy-in from the team. We'll give it some thought, and we'll try and refactor this and come up with something nice. So um, yeah, so that's like the kind of context, the, the the situation we had, the specific problem that was building up, and what we wanted to solve. Does that all make sense so far? Yep. So what we had already, I'm just going to have a sip of this. We already had kind of onion solution architecture. So I'm sure everyone's seen that diagram on the, it's all over the internet. We have the domain in the middle. We have, uh, you know, kind of entities and value objects and things in the domain. Then around that, we'll have an application layer with business logic, probably then infrastructure. And then the very outermost thinnest layer would be those executable applications. And they call straight into application as soon as possible. So we already had that. We're already using minimal API, which this would have worked without it, but it, it did kind of help a little bit. And we already had this concept of trying to not use exceptions for expected scenarios. So what I mean by this is, if the user gives us bad data in our API, didn't really want to use exception handling for that because um, they don't perform particularly well, and it's not exceptional. We, we code around that. You know, We expect the user to give us bad data, so we're hoping not to use exceptions. And so for that, we're using the one-of library. Is anyone? Fan of the one-off library? Yeah, cool, good. So I'm just going to quickly, oh, sorry, I'm going to be right in your way. Just going to quickly flick over to here. So what I mean by that, I have here a sample app. It's a kind of a adulterated version of the file new project weather forecast app that we all know and love in Visual Studio. So we've got this map get endpoint here to get a weather forecast for a particular region on a particular date. So we can get the region and the date from using this from root attribute. And then we've got this from services attribute where we can rummage around in the IAC container and find something that can handle this request for us. If we go and have a look at this request, um, uh, yeah, you can see it takes the region and the date. And then the thing that it returns is a task of one of weather report response or failure or T success and T failure, really. So what, what this one-off does is it gives us discriminated unions in C-sharp. Now, there have been a few rumblings that uh, unions in some shape or form might be coming to C-sharp. I think it's the highest requested feature at the moment. So hopefully, whether w quite what shape they'll take, we'll have to wait and see. But um, I'm hoping that they'll be a little bit less ceremonious than uh, one-off is. But anyway, one-off is, it fills a gap. So basically, this variable here is precisely one of the list of things that you put in here. So it's either a weather report response or a failure. And in this case, a failure, if we go and have a look at it, is a one-off base. So this can also encapsulate kind of various different failures. So an invalid request failure, an unsupported region failure, and some others. Um, so if I head back to the program, I've got this create response for method. I wonder if I can get it all on. Hopefully you can see most of that. So we have like a delegate here, a func which returns that task of one off T success or failure. And when we invoke that, we get this result. And then we can use this match method, which is part of the one of library. And it requires a branch for each option in the union. So if I, for instance, comment that out, I get a red squiggly telling me that match has two parameters, but it's invoked with one argument. So it kind of protects us there. And then um, these can be called whatever you like, but basically because you need a, uh, a branch for each argument, they're in the right order. So that because we define the success object first, this first one is success. So this is the weather report response. We can just wrap it in the OK and send it back. Otherwise, if we get a failure, we can do a secondary match. And then depending on the failure, we can figure out what to do. So if it's an invalid request, we can use it to get some validation problem details, wrap it in a bad request or we can decide what to do. So basically, the API executable application is called straight into application. Application knows how to return either the success or the failures. They're kind of like domain level. And then we just make the decisions around how to pass that back. So all the HTTP concerns are at the outer layer. Um, so I'm going to head back to here. So refactoring options then for this um, handler that was growing. We could have just abstracted the code into a few more classes. This is the kind of thing that we probably all do all day long. 
This would have involved kind of um, awaiting a method, assigning the result, checking the result, deciding whether to return, rinse and repeat. That would have been perfectly fine, but we were hoping to find a better way. We also looked at Mediator. So Mediator is a great library. It would have given us a kind of super decoupled chain of tasks. But we looked at a few repos at ClearBank where we had been using Mediator. And the, uh, I think one issue with Mediator is it's very hard to see the flow. You need to know what just happened to figure out what command is then created. Then you go and find a command handler to find out what happens next and then see what command is created then. Then go and find that com command handler. It can be a lot quite intensive, like labor intensive, just searching through a code base, especially if it's new. We also considered raising domain driven design style kind of internal domain events. We had a few issues with that, which I, uh, I won't, I'm not going to go into, but we did actually come right back round to use domain events to store our state eventually, which I'll get onto later. Um, so I also had this kind of niggling past memory of Windows Workflow Foundation. I don't know if anyone remembers this. It's kind of Marmite technology from the 2000s. But uh, some people hated it. Some people never tried it. Other people quite enjoyed it. Um, there was definitely something about it. You've got this kind of canvas here. You'd have a toolbox and these things called activities that you could drag on. This sequence activity was one of the built-in ones. Um, this one's almost certainly a code activity because it's got new, no UI. You could provide a UI if you wanted to. And you just kind of drag these things on. And um, you can kind of really easily understand the flow of tasks. And you also get this kind of functional workflow as well because each one has hopefully a nicely scoped name and task. It has a set of in arguments, a set of out arguments, and possibly I think it had in out arguments as well. But we'll, <laughs> we'll leave that to one side. So actually it was quite easy to onboard new team members because you could say to a new team member, there's a bug in the create order reply activity. All they need to know is where it is in the flow. They've got a very clear list of um, arguments in and out and a nice small scope. Um, so they can go and like become productive but without needing to understand the entirety of the system. So there's some things about that that I quite liked. And I suppose all of this gave us a set of aims. So we wanted to kind of declaratively define a flow of tasks in a single place, which meant pushing the complexity down to, to keep the top level nice and clear wanted to maintain some of that functional way to work. We wanted whatever we had to be easy to navigate, debug, and kind of no harder to test than anything else. Uh, and in a word, easy to grok. Now, this is a really old word, which I'd come across in the past. I had to look it up to see whether it was still a thing or not. And actually, when I found the definition, um, it was just perfect for this, like coming back to write a, a talk about this process. Um, is to understand intuitively or by empathy. It's quite a long definition, but at the end as well, also to experience enjoyment. And this is from the Oxford English Dictionary, but actually it's, uh, it's an interesting word because it's the only word in the English language that's actually derived from Martian. And um, yep, it was coined for a novel called Stranger in a Strange Land in 1961. So there you go, piece of random useless information for you. So what did we come up with then as a solution? Right, so if I go back to the code. <clears throat> so if we go to this handler then, we're just going to do control F12 and it'll take me straight to it. Oops, I meant to go there first. There we go. So this, this is kind of an example of what we didn't want. So we didn't just want to do validate, await it, assign the result, check the result, decide whether to return. Then the same, check, check the date on a date checker thing, await it, assign it, decide whether to return. This, we wanted something better than that. This is the flow that we wanted to represent. Um, so kind of like validate the region, check the date, maybe check a cache, and then eat, decide whether to call this uh, generator thing at the bottom. But we didn't, we didn't want to do it like that. So what did we actually come up with? So this is what we came up with. I don't know if people can see that, but hopefully if you just glance at it, it's quite nice and easy to read. It kind of tells a story. It's self-documenting. Um, there's a couple of things you'll notice. Like There's a single return keyword, a single await keyword. And um, it's just really nice and quite terse. So what's actually going on here is we've got this weather report details object here. And um, 
and this kind of static factory-ish create method, that actually returns that task. It's, it's all about that task of um, one of t success or t failure. So this is actually the t success, and that gets passed down through the chain as long as everything is fine. As soon as something goes wrong, a failure is returned, and in the then extension method, if it detects a failure, it doesn't call the next like the next job. So we'll go and have a look in the in, in that method in a minute. Um, does that kind of make sense so far? Cool. So um, you might notice there's no cache. There's no call to the cache thing. I do actually have a little dummy check cache method here. So this is all very contrived, not particularly realistic, but hopefully it, it demonstrates the point. So once we've checked the region and checked the date, how hard is it to add a new method in here? Well, actually, it's not very hard. So we can just call the check cache method here. Now, what's actually going on here is these methods take this weather report details. And if they have a, only the single argument, um, we're using method conversion, we get this kind of really terse syntax. But what actually is going on is this. So we get the details, and then it's passed into each method like that. So that'll, that'll now tell me I can convert it to a method group. OK, so what if we need to pass something else in? Maybe we need a string called settings or something like that. That's fine. We can just add a string called settings, give it some stuff. Pass that in. So we can do anything we can do with an ordinary method, really. Um, the key is for it to be chained, it has to return this task of one of t success or t failure. So whatever the success is for this flow, um, as long as we return that, this, that, that method can be chained. So here, this is a local method. These are off services that we've pulled in from IAC. Um, so yeah, there we go. We're checking the cache. And then what if we had a hit? Well, we could, there's a slight variation of the then method called if then, and that is going to take, oh, get out of the way. That's going to take an additional uh, kind of delegate here. So if I say d goes to d dot populated from cache equals false, then only generate if the cache, if we didn't find a cache hit. So we can kind of express little bits of um, decision logic as well in the flow. Obviously, you'd need a bit of caution there. If you put loads of stuff in there, you'd kind of wouldn't see the wood for the trees again. But you can kind of use judgment to kind of express important decisions at that top level of the flow. Right, so I just check my notes. <clears throat> What's actually going on inside this method then? So I hope you can see this. Um, it starts off quite simple. Some of the versions of this, these methods get complex, so you can see I've done my best with triple slash comments in the NuGet package to <laughs> try and explain what's going on. But the name is then. <clears throat> we have these two generic type specifications here, uh, success and failure, but I've abbreviated them to TS and TF just so that it doesn't get too big. We must return the task of one of TS and TF. That's so that we can continue the chain. We have this previous job result with the this keyword. So this is the thing that we're extending. This is how, it, how it's able to chain together. Uh, so that is the result of the previous link in the chain, which is how you can get that chaining. And what happens here is we just await the previous job result. Now, it's probably already been awaited, unless we're that first link in the chain. But it doesn't matter, because we're using full fat task, we're allowed to await twice. It, value task is not supported. Um, so what we do here is we await that, and then we can use one of the methods on one of. So is t0 would tell us if it's a success. Is t1 will tell us if it's a failure in this case. If it was a failure, we just return, and we don't do the next job. Otherwise, if it wasn't, we can use as t0 to turn this back into the, the details class in this case, and that's when we execute the next job. Uh, with me so far? So then we've got a version of this which also has an on failure delegate. <clears throat> so this does exactly the same as before, only um, we capture the result of next job, see whether it was, um, if it was all good, we just return it. Otherwise, we'll call the on failure delegate, and that will give us a chance to tidy up any stuff that we need to now tidy up because it failed. Um, I'll show you an example of that later. And the on failure delegate can actually return a new failure. Um, so you'll either get the new failure or the previous failure. Uh, then we've got the if then. So that's the same as the other, but now we've got this additional 
um, delegate here called condition. So we're going to get the, the T success and we need to return a bool. And only if we return a true, um, you can see here condition is evaluated here. So as soon as we've decided whether or not we should immediately return the failure, then we'll evaluate the condition and um, only call next job if it was true. So there's a couple of other interesting versions. There's a then for each, which gives you the ability to provide a list of items to iterate over and a task for each one. Um, I'm going to skip over that one. And I've got some parallel ones as well. The first time I did this talk, somebody said, what if I want to do some parallel tasks? And I was like, hmm, that's an interesting challenge. So um, there's a then wait for first, which I think could be useful. It just simply does a task dot when any, and the first one that returns a success will be returned down the, through the flow. So I, I could see this being used if you had a, an API to call and it was quite volatile and you had a few instances of it, you could fire off a call to all three of them and, or, or however many you had, just respond to the first one that came back. There is a then wait for all, uh, but there's no way this library can know how to merge the results of a set of tasks. <laughs> you have to provide your own merging strategy. There is a, there's a method with a default merging strategy, but it's very naive. And you, yeah, so caution needed there, definitely. So that's, that's the extension method. There's also a different class with a version of all of these with um, cancellation token support as well. So that was the... That was the solution, so I'm going to go back to my slides. So just to recap, um, the answer that we found or that we came up with was the combination of an ex a generic extension method, the returning of a one-of, and an object which represents success that's passed down through the chain. Any method which returns task of one-of, t success, or t failure can then be chained, no matter where it comes from. And the key thing is that the extension method only invokes the next job if the current result is a T success. Otherwise, if we've had a failure at any point in the chain, that failure will just get passed all the way down. That's what enables us to have the single return keyword. Um, so I've got like a kind of contrived example here, which I put on LinkedIn for the first time I did this talk. But it just, it kind of, um, it just shows that you can be quite expressive with this um, kind of method. So. I should have come up with something a bit more imaginative than state store, but if, um, if you drive to an event, if you're feeling hungry, tasks to eat pizza, passing in your favorite flavors, then wait for first, full stomach or run out of pizza, then wait for all, learn stuff, ask questions, chat with new friends and drive home, ha hopefully happy and inspired. <clears throat> and I, I, went, I saw a talk by David Whitney this year called Minimalism in a World of Dogmatic Design. Anyone seen that? If you haven't, it's on YouTube, but it's really, really good. And he, he came up with this quote, um, code is literature, it's an expression of intent communicated between developers. Incidentally, it happens to be compiled and executed by machines. And it just hit me between the eyes, because if you think about it, if you write a piece of code and you put it into production, and years later it's just sat there, still doing its job, it never needed to be changed or looked at or anything, then great, you're doing something better than most of us. Most code lives, doesn't it? It, it's, it has to be maintained, it has to be patched, it has to be kept up to date. It's looked after by a team that kind of changes over time. So it's actually, I think, more important that the developers can figure out what the previous developers meant, or even what they meant uh, months earlier. So um, yeah, I'm really quite big on writing code that's easy to read and kind of looks as English-like as possible because then you, you spend less time kind of figuring out what, what was going on, what is the intent. The intent becomes the star of the show is basically what I'm getting at. Um, yeah, so it also turns out that this is kind of the chain of responsibility design pattern uh, of which there is some information on a very good website called Refactoring Guru. There's a few other examples of that. The, um, the request pipeline handler in ASP.NET Core be in one and media to be in another. However, they, those two both do that kind of slightly magic scanning of an application of a assembly for, you know, <clears throat> middleware or command handlers or whatever, and it's it's a little bit less hard, a uh, little bit less easy to figure out what's going on in one place. There's also a Fluent Results Library, which somebody pointed out, out to me, which does quite a similar thing. You don't like that? No, it's not good. No, it's. 
So it uses that kind of dot bind syntax. So the, the result is the, the kind of key part, the, the, the primary the citizen. It has like success and failures, but failures can be anything. Yes. So if you're trying to, re to understand what your return types are something. So say you abstract something away and you want to know its return types. Yeah. You, you, you guess. It's like having an exception. You don't know what it could be. So you have to do like has, a, has error of T. Yeah. Maybe you <clears throat> I think you can have a, an, um, a whole series of successes and failures in the result, can't you, as well? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> okay. So the next step then, um, orchestration. So I'm going to head back to Visual Studio. So let's go back to the program. And imagine that we're not content by just serving up weather forecasts, but we now want to enable our enthusiastic users who have got weather stations bolted to their chimneys to submit data to us, and maybe we'll pay them for the process, uh, for the privilege. So I've got here a collected weather data post endpoint. It's going to be weather data for a given location, which is just going to be a string at this point. We can get the model from the body. We can do the same thing and grab a service that can handle this request. I'm also getting a couple of other things and injecting them in for reasons that I'll hopefully remember to explain later. So let's go and have a look inside this thing here. So I'm just, obviously I'm at the API, which is the place where you'd go for a new project, um, if there was one, and I can just do a one control F12 and it's gonna take me straight to the, where the flows are. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is slightly different now. We've not got that details thing anymore. That turned out not to be as good as we were hoping. Um, we've now got this thing here, which is actually more of a kind of uh, an aggregate root entity type thing. So we come in here to our handler. We've got our data model. Uh, we can do some validation here. If the validation passes, then we can create a new request ID. And then we've got this persist or hydrate method. So it still returns the task of one of um, T success or failure. So that's what enables it to kick off the, the, the chain of events. But actually what it's doing here is if this is a new request, we're going to pop the first domain event in, which is kind of this thing here. Um, and if, if we failed somewhere along the line and we're kind of coming back from a retry, then that will be a hydrate of that existing uh, aggregate. Otherwise it will be a new aggregate. And that, so the, the, I'm not going to major on this, but the problem with the details class before was it was actually its latest iteration was a record with some nullable properties on it, which started off null. And then when we made a kind of deep copy with the new keyword, we would then assign these new things so they weren't any longer null. That was all fine. But what we realized was you had to know which flow you were in in order to know which properties had been set, which was a bit rubbish. So we changed over to this kind of domain event backed state. So just in a nutshell, I'm not going to major on this, but Every time something happens, we save a domain event. That goes all the way to the database before being added to a local collection of domain events, and that's what backs the state. So all the, all the state properties on this weather data collection object will, uh, are backed by domain events. So uh, yeah, then we can call locate on some kind of location manager. So that's going to give us back an ID for the location. Maybe it's a location we've seen before, or maybe it will create a new one and give us a new ID. And then we can submit this thing to our weather modeling service. So in my imagination, it's a kind of Met Office style supercomputer down the hallway that we're going to make an API request to. And then it's going to call us back via an integration event on service bus. So the rest, whole rest of the flow from here, uh, we're just going to do two results to turn the um, collection into a collection response. So that's basically telling the user, yeah, it's accepted. We'll get around to it at some point. The whole rest of the flow now is in integration event handlers. And I guess what we realized is there's absolutely no reason we can't kind of co-locate those in the same place and use the same kind of logic. So if we go up to the top of this class, we can see, I'm, I'm not sure whether I should have the word post. It's a bit too rest, but um, ignore that. So this class kind of advertises what it does here. So it implements post weather data handler. It also handles modeling data accepted, modeling data rejected, and finally modeling, sorry, model updated. So this one class now is kind of truly an orchestrator. We can see in one place 
it's like a map of what this, at least what this vertical slice of the system does. So we've, we start with this uh, HTTP request handler, then sometime later we might either get a model data, uh, well we might get a rejected event, that's like the end of the flow, so for that we'll just save a domain event and that's the end of it, or we'll get an accepted, which means, you know, great, it's, it's now being incorporated into the model, and then finally we'll get a model updated integration event. So I'm just going to make some changes to this because I said we would use a, um, we would pay the, the users. So we've got this I contributor payment service interface. I should say these interfaces are all defined in application but um, implemented in infrastructure. So if we add a read only field for this thing and then once we've done the location thing, we can add a new method for this. We can say contributor payment service dot create pending payment. And then we call submit. Well, there's a chance this might go wrong straight away. So here we can use that on failure delegate that I was talking about. Let's just change that to a C and that to an F, just because we haven't got much room. And we can now say contributor payment service dot revoke, I think it's called passing in the collection, and I'm going to shove that on the next line down, uh, like that, and I'm going to move my comment back up, just so that it still kind of makes sense. So we call submit, we're calling an API responses via integration event, but if that goes wrong, we can just revoke that payment, so we can kind of tidy up something that we've just done in the same chain. So if we got model data rejected, at that point, we'd also want to revoke the payment. And then if we get accepted in between these two domain events here, we can commit that payment. There we go. So, and the interesting thing here is um, revoke, I'm calling it twice from two different flows, sorry. This one here is from the API, kind of executable application. This one here is from a completely different one. This is the event handler, but because they're both calling into application, um, we can kind of like get reuse because we're using the same domain aggregate route, the same T success down through the flows. So let me just quickly check my notes. Yep, I said it was easy to test as well, so I will quickly show you some what we call end-to-end -end component tests um, to prove that it works. So what we've got here is a, I wonder if it's easier to use that. No, it's not. Hopefully you can see this. We have a single test fixture here, which is going to give us back some helper methods, given, when, and then, which just help us to organize our test code. And then we've got one given and several when and thens that represent the different phases. So we can say, given we have some collected weather data and uh, really enjoying using out variables here, which are a bit kind of old fashioned, but I, I really like them here. So you get to define them in line and then you can kind of click on them and see where they're used. Um, the modeling service submit endpoint will return and accepted and then the servers are started. And what we're doing here is we're using the MVC, I never remember the NuGet package, the, the one that allows you to run up an ASP.NET Core application in memory and it gives you back an in-memory client. You know the one? I'm sure probably people are using it. That's the one, yeah. So we're using that, but in the servers are started, if we just quickly go in there, you can see I've got two. I've got one for the API, one for the event listener, and at work, in that scenario that I drew up, we've got one for the outbox as well. And we can start both of those in memory. Um, and then, so in phase one, we wrap that collected weather data into, in a HTTP, uh, HTTP message. That's going to give us this, oh, sorry, can't seem to scroll sideways. Well, just over there is an HTTP message, uh, a request there. And then we send that to the API. So that's like the first phase kicked off. So then we can do our assertions for the first phase, which is the modeling service submit endpoint should, be, should have been called one time. The main event should have been uh, persisted call, uh, of type submitted to modeling. The response should have been, uh, the response status code should have been okay. 
and also the body should not have been empty. And we're going to grab the body also as an out variable so that we can uh, simulate some integration events which will cause it to rehydrate the, the correct aggregate. So once we've done the assertions for phase one, then we can simulate a message appearing um, here. So this is going to be the modeling data accepted using the correct request ID. And we can assert that we should then have a model data accepted domain event. And then finally, we simulate the last event, which is model updated. So I'm just going to quickly run this, and then we'll debug it and see what's going on. There we go. So it passed. I've got a few breakpoints strewn around the place. So the first one we're going to hit is the API program.cs. So you won't be able to see this, but if you take my word for it, that is the web API program run async. So hit F F5. Now we're running up the message handler. Um, hit F5 again. Now we've come into the orchestrator. So this is the handle post weather data endpoint. I think I've... Now you can, you can step through this stuff, but you get if you get bogged down in the lines of the then extension method, it's not much fun. So the better way to do it is to go straight to locate or whatever the method is and stick a breakpoint in there, um, so, which I think I have one of. So yeah, there's the locate method. We'll hit F5 again. Now we've jumped straight down to the model data accepted. So we're now in phase two, um, which is going to do this flow. Now we're in the last phase, uh, model updated. So this is telling us now that the uh, models, the new data has been incorporated into the model. And then finally, the last assertion, I'll just step in here just to prove to you that it is working. So we can get the type of T, we can get the event class name, which is model updated. And then on my fixture, I can go into my in-memory kind of database connection mock thing, have a look at the persisted events. And you won't be able to see this, but there's six in there, and the last one is model updated. And if I open that up, you can see event class name is model updated. So it is indeed working. There we go. So uh, let me just check my notes. Yeah, cool. Back to the slides. I'm nearly there. Don't worry. So just as a recap, then, we can define related flows together as long as we kind of share the same T success object. We can get some reuse out of our chain methods in the different flows. Um, significant things only probably at the top level flow. And this can go wrong in both directions. So you can have significant stuff hidden in the chain methods, which deserves a place at the top. Like I had members in my team doing way too much down below. And I was like, no, no that's interesting. Why don't you put it at the top? But you can also put too much at the top and then you know obscure the, 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 the kind of main story as well. Um, and I just put that there to remind me to show the end-to-end -end test because I forgot last time. So yeah, benefits then. It's easy to reason about the entire system or vertical slice. So we have a use case where the system we're working on needs to connect to various different payment schemes. So I'm talking about kind of back, uh, not backs, chaps and faster payments in the UK, Target 2, SEPA instance, SEPA CT in Europe and various others. As we go into more jurisdictions, there'll be more schemes to uh, connect to and I can see like a vertical slice per scheme working really nicely here with an orchestrator which knows how to kind of kick off the process and then it has handlers for each of the integration events that come back in the various um, scenarios and it will be nice and easy to kind of arrange those in in different folders. Better than a diagram now controversial I know but um, you could dumb down your system into a diagram so you can have a refinement session about it or if you've got that orchestrator right, you could just put that up on the screen because even business, business analysts and product owners can. I, I showed my product owner. He was asking me, what does this service do? I was like, oh, let me just show you. And he's like, well, I don't really want to look at the code. Actually, when he, when he looked at it, he was like, hmm, I, I can tell what's going on here. You know, he didn't obviously know exactly what was going on, but he could understand the English and he could kind of reason about it. So yeah, accessible potentially to non-technical people. Um, and I guess one interesting thing here is uh, what we came up with in the end is event sourced. So everything significant that happens in the system, we save a, an internal domain event for. 
but we're not handling those events, so we're not, uh, our flow isn't expressed in terms of past tense events, which quite, can be quite hard to understand. Um, so we're still event sourced, but it's the flow that drives uh, the process, and that is defined all in one place, and so hopefully quite easy to understand. So somebody asked me about performance, which was a really valid question. So I've got here two benchmarks. This is actually the, the, the meetup kind of code. It doesn't do anything, but it's just showing the difference between if you were to call these methods separately or you call them in a flow. And I've got these results. So unsurprisingly, it's um, twice as slow, I guess, as the chaining is twice as slow. But these are nanoseconds, so this is 0.4 microseconds. This is 1.4 microseconds. So um, if you're going to call an API or something, it's going to be seconds or milliseconds. So I would suggest microseconds. Completely negligible. <laughs> so um, yes, it's twice as slow, but only in a minuscule way. Uh, there are limitations, of course. I mentioned the caution needed around handling results of parallel methods. So yeah, the, the when, the wait for all definitely needs some caution if, if it was going to be used. So I did mention quickly, this only works with full fat task, and that's because I value task source, the in, that interface in a value task is kind of pooled and reused for uh, different consumers to reduce memory allocation. So you can only await exactly once. If you await a second time, it will throw. So um, I haven't even tried supporting value task. It's just, it's just not going to work. I'm, and I'm OK with that because value task is for situations where you're pretty sure the result is already available anyway. Caution also needed when managing dependencies for the orchestration. So you might have remembered that I injected those extra two services into that um, HTTP method handler. And that's because with a, you, you can do that with an HTTP call. With a method handler with our, uh, sorry, an event handler with our implementation uh, being generic, there's no, it's just a handler of T. There's no way to inject any other services. So what that means is, even if your API doesn't need access to the database. If it's connected to the orchestrator, the orchestrator does need everything in its constructor. So it ends up being a kind of pool of all the dependencies you might ever need. Now, you could obviously co-locate several classes or subclasses in one file. And with um, primary constructors, that is kind of trivial now. So um, yeah, before, you could kind of hide the constructor in a region and just forget it was there. But now, with primary constructors, it's not actually that bad. But yeah, that, that is a limitation. So conclusions then. Did we succeed in our refactoring effort according to the aims? I think we did. Hopefully you'll agree. Am I advocating the use of this for everyone and everything? No, I'm not. Uh, but it is worth considering the benefits of easily understandable top-level code. So if you're going to do something like this and you're going to try and sell it, this would be my attempt at kind of selling it to um, maybe non non-engineering stakeholders. So it's, it's easy to read and understand, which hopefully means less time spent context switching, potentially means faster onboarding, and you could, you could kind of hash a potential cost savings calculation. I don't, it wouldn't be that useful, but you, you could potentially do that. So easy to use, because the orchestration code is very easy to navigate, debug, and test, um, I'm reasoning that it's therefore easier to change and maintain. The lower impedance side of things, so um, because it's, the intent is clear and it reads like English, hopefully, potentially could be understood by product owners and business analysts. And then I'm going also for happier engineers. I don't know about you, but if I get to write elegant and intelligible code, it makes me happy. Um, I'm pleased with myself, so that's it. So if there's any questions, I'd be happy to take them. But otherwise, the NuGet package is here, but it's, it's literally two classes of extension methods. So feel free to just copy them in and change them if you want to. Uh, the GitHub with all this, uh, all the code and the examples is here. And I wrote a blog that you can either find on my personal blog or on the ClearBank uh, Medium publication. So, and yeah, I'm on LinkedIn or that's my email address if um, you want to contact me. Thanks for having me and thanks for listening. <laughs>